All right. Hello, everybody. I'm seeing a good two thirds of our planned attendees, of our registered attendees, sorry, um, have joined the stream already. Um, and as I know, we have a lot of contact uh, content, sorry, to get through uh, today. And that this um, webinar is recorded, I think um, we are going to get started. Um, all right. So welcome, everybody. My name is Toby Langel. I'm um, the um, tech lead for the Open Regulatory Compliance Working Group of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, and today, um, we are starting our series of webinars on the CRA. Um, and so, you know, why the series? Well, as we got started working um, on uh, the working group and starting to work um, on the content of the working group, we realized really quickly that there was a lot to learn for a lot of us, uh, myself included. Um, and so we designed this series of webinars to essentially do um, four things. First of all is bring everyone uh, in, in the community up to speed as quickly as possible on the specifics of the CRA. Um, better understand how the CRA is going to be implemented. Uh, now we have the legal text, uh, but there's a lot more to uh, European legislation than just the legal text itself. Um, and so um, the purpose of this, this um, uh, webinar is to help us also better understand the implementation phase. Um, thirdly, of course, on this better understand the impact on open source and essentially uh, get us all well aligned on what the uh, process of um, this law moving forward is going to be and how as a community we can best impact this process. Um, so for this, um, we have uh, we have planned four uh, webinars in the series. Uh, today, we're going to learn about how to read the CRA. If you're like me and uh, we're incredibly uh, daunted by the perspective of going through those 300 pages um, and sort of understanding uh, how they all fit and how they're going to impact the open source and uh, uh, manufacturers who leverage open source. Uh, that's going to be uh, a great uh, a great session today, and there are three more sessions planned. Um, the second session will be on understanding the obligations that the CRA creates uh, for the open source community. Um, the third one will be on understanding the whole standards making process, especially in the um, European Union, um, because there's a, there's a lot that is specific um, uh, that is tied to legislation that if you uh, are not um, aware of, it's going to be very useful to better understand. Um, and then in the last uh, webinar of the series, we'll look at all of the other aspect of the implementation, uh, uh, in particular, focused on stewards, but not only, and those will be looking at the guidelines and the attestations, et cetera. Um, and so uh, for today, um, uh, I am incredibly happy to welcome Enzo Ribagnac, who is our Associate Director for European Public Policy, and who is to going to tell you everything about how to better understand and to read the CRA. So I was able to look at the, the slides before this, and I learned lots of things. So I'm sure you're going to be, um, it's going to be very, a very useful uh, session for you all. Um, and so without further ado, um, uh, please allow me to welcome Enzo. Enzo, the floor is yours. Thanks, Toby. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so today's session, uh, and I will try to wrap everything in 30 minutes so that we have time for questions. Um, in order to save time, uh, we uh, have agreed to take questions at the end, and I'm very sorry for this. So it will be 30 minutes of me explaining the slides on how to read the CRA and try to identify the key parts of the CRA for effective compliance, but very much focusing on open source software and implementation related to open source software, right? So the idea of this, of this webinar was um, that I could provide to the open source community and the ORC open source regulatory compliance working group community, sort of a similar presentation that I give uh, within uh, Eclipse as my role for uh, Associate Director on European Public Policy. So it's not going to be an exhaustive presentation about what is the CRA, what are all the, the, the requirements within the CRA, uh, but it's more going to be a presentation about how can I efficiently read uh, the CRA, what parts should I focus on, uh, and, and 
you know, if I have questions, if I'm reading, if something it's not clear, um, where can I easily find the answer to my questions within the text itself? Um, the resources that I will be uh, discussing in or references, or if you wonder, you know, where did I get all this information? We will share this presentation right after. And if you check the comment section of each slide, you will find resources uh, that I used for each of these slides. So now if uh, we look at today's session and, and sort of the target of the session, um, the idea is really that we help non-legal stakeholders so people involved uh, um, in the open source community concerning the CRA to navigate a legal text without too much hurdle, right? Without being lost in the 300 pages that Toby mentioned. It's also to help reading efficiently the CRA, as I mentioned before, by quickly accessing the relevant information within the text um, and find answers already present in the text. This way uh, we can move quickly move forward as a community uh, um, and not you know, always ask the same questions uh, ourselves. And I'm guilty of this uh, mainly. And, and thirdly, uh, we'll try to identify the relevant parts, as I mentioned before, and also identify the elements that the Open Source Regulatory Compliance Working Group will be working on, right? There are some elements that are pretty much not relevant for the open source community that are still present in the text. And again, this is the session uh, of July 15, but there will be other sessions, some probably answering uh, the questions you might have that this uh, um, webinar does not answer to. So in 30 minutes, I try to, to give uh, uh, this sort of presentation today. Uh, just as a, as a reminder, uh, we already have within Open Source Regulatory Compliance Working Group, some resources uh, that are helpful. Uh, we have a mailing list, we have office hours when we can ask all the questions. We even have a community calendar that is sort of uh, um, summarizing everything. We have a matrix chat service and we're building now a CRA information hub that is gathering all the information. All the recording of these webinars will be present on this. So if you have a question, if something is in there, it's not in my presentation, you have the other webinars and you also have all the resources present in Open Regulatory Compliance Working Group that are designed for this. Now, the agenda of today, as I said, it's it would be sort of a presentation that I would give to staff that we have within the Eclipse Foundation. So first, the structure of an EU legislation, right? So how do I read, how do I understand the use of a recital, the use of article, the use of annexes, all these sort of elements. Then we start focusing more and more on the open source element within the CRA. So what elements in the CRA are clearly about open source? And uh, then we'd have sort of reading use case. In that case, I think I should say use cases. Um, one looking at stewards, the other one looking at manufacturer. Um, I, I call that a use case, but it's it's sort of a general understanding of now that I have all the information concerning how to read the texts, if I am a steward, if I am a manufacturer, what, where do I pick all the information? And then some of a conclusion, some of a wrap up of, of what we'll be discussing, of what we have discussed at the end of, of this. And then we'll take the questions, obviously. So let's get into it. The structure of uh, an EU legislation. So say that on the left right here, this is an EU legislation, right? This document is an EU legislation. This text would be then composed of the title, as usual, nothing new there. Then you'd have what it's called the preamble. The preamble is made of citations uh, that generally start by having regards, etc. but they're not really relevant for today. So we'll focus on the recitals, the things that arrived after the citation starting with having regards. And then you'd have the body of the text, right? So pretty simple. I'm pretty sure everyone knew this before. It's actually not the full structure of the EU legislation if we talk about implementation. You'd have annexes on top of that. The CRA is a perfect example of that. You have a few annexes there. You also have the Implementing Act, Delegated Act that also come as sort of part of an EU body or EU legislation body uh, gathering several documents. Then you'd have standards um, that generally come in order to uh, um, sort of interpret the text uh, from a technical standpoint. And then you'd have guidance and others. And again, the CRA is a perfect example here because you have all the above within the text. So here is an idea that the CRA and an EU legislation in general is just not reading one part and you don't have to read everything as well, right? So say that we're entering into the body of the CRA itself or the body of an EU legislation in general. I don't think we need to spend much time on what is the title, it's pretty clear. Uh, as I said before, the citations are not really relevant for us. So let's look at the recitals. What are the recitals here for and how can I use them when I read the legislation? Generally, the recitals are here in order to sort of set out concise reasons 
for the provision and the articles that are present within the text, but without paraphrasing, right? So you'd find answers concerning the reasoning behind an article. You'd find clarifications. You know, something might not be entirely clear when I read the definition or when I read some of the obligations. So here the recitals can help me to read and understand better. Generally, uh, the best way to read the recitals is to connect the recitals with the relevant article, right? So if you start reading all the recitals, it's going to take you a long time, and some of them might not be uh, super relevant for you to understand how to comply quickly or if you fall in the scope, right? For example, uh, within the CRA, the very early recitals, they give you context on why this is needed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but that's not really going to help you to comply or to understand the text itself. So you can skip those, for example, if you focus on, on, on specific open source product uh, compliance. Generally, the recitals are uh, ordered chronologically uh, in a sense that they follow what the text is saying, right? So the recitals concerning Article 1 would be put before the recitals concerning Article 2. Obviously, you have recitals connecting to uh, several uh, articles themselves, but that's the the, the 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 order and the logic of the order. It's chronological. And then finally, it's important to understand that recitals are considered legally non-binding in the sense that they are used to interpret the text, but they're not the interpret the text themselves. They are not the text themselves. So this is concerning the recitals. Now we have the articles. Uh, again, here uh, I, I'm pretty sure that most of you know this. They're, the way they organize is important. Um, for example, uh, you would have the scope and the definition first. Um, and the reason why I'm saying this is because sometimes we might have questions concerning an obligation for a manufacturer, an obligation for the steward, but they might not be super clear. And we might not be completely sure whether or not they apply to me or if they don't apply to me. And in that case, linking the obligation, the article itself, together with the definition might be extremely useful. Um, maybe I feel like some of the application of stewards are not really fitting for me. And then I read again the definition of what is a steward. And it's actually very helpful because I understand that I don't have to comply with this. Similar for recitals, right? So the idea is that using the body of the text and reading it, reading the obligation, we sort of give me an overview of the, 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 the real requirements. Of, of the text, but then I can complement this with recitals. And then again, I can reuse the definition again to just be sure all the time, right? So you'd have a definition of what is available on the market, you'd have uh, put on the market, sorry, then you would have um, um, uh, elements concerning the definition of software, all these sort of, of elements that are in the definition are very useful. So that's why I'm under underlining this. Then here, it's very important uh, to underline it's legally binding, it's pretty logical, but I just wanted to underline this as it was underlined concerning the recitals. Then we're entering into the annexes, right? So um, we mentioned before recitals, uh, the use of recitals, the use of the body and the articles themselves. And now we're entering into what is an annex and why is it here? Generally, the annex is used to present materials separately from the body of the text because it's voluminous or because it's technical or maybe both. So it helps the reading of the text in order to uh, um, read the text easily. You'd have the, the, the articles that refer to annexes and then the annex will give you all the, the, the elements, right? So if I look at the, at the CRA, for instance, many of the articles of manufacturers are referring to essential requirements, but in order to to start entering into uh, all the technical elements of essential requirements that they put into an annex. And the annex here has the same value than the text. It is part of enacting terms, as we use uh, in, in legal terminology, uh, of the CRA or of any EU legislation. Here, as I mentioned before, again, same legal value, so it's legally, legally binding. Now entering the three other elements that I mentioned before, um, the Implementing Act and the Delegated Act. Um, again, they're very important in order to um, read the, 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 the EU legislation, and I will explain after why specifically for the CRA and for open source delegated act and implementing act are extremely relevant. Generally, an implementing act is here to create sort of a uniform implementation of the legislative act, right? It's building on what it said in the text so that I can create an implementation that is uniform for all actors. So it helps the actors understanding how to implement. When I say actors here in the case of the CRA, you know, that could be us as the open source community, that could be uh, um, uh, true for, um, if I remember well, uh, providers of, of uh, cloud services, but it can also be for authorities that are subject to the legislation too. 
um, in the case of implementing act, they are normally adopted by the European Commission directly after consultation of expert group and other technical committees. So what's interesting for us as a community, an open source community, is to understand that the implementing act concerning the CRA will be adopted after a consultation of what is considered to be the expert group on, on Cyber Resilience Act. So very important for us to sort of send inputs at that time uh, as, as the Open Regulatory Compliance uh, Working Group. Then we would have the Delegated Act. Um, the Delegated Acts are here to amend or supplement the non-essential elements of legislation. So here again, very much legally binding, binding sorry, it can amend and it can supplement uh, some of the elements present in the legislation, in that case, for instance, the CRA. We'll see after how uh, the CRA is leveraging Delegated Act for open source uh, software, because it's, it's quite an interesting use case. And, and I think it's very important for us to really understand our important implementing act and delegated act are going to be for um, uh, for the open source community connected to the CRA. Now, the standards, um, again, I think uh, many of you in this call might know what standard stands for, but there are elements that we should discuss and we have in mind here when we read the CRA and, and when we understand that some elements are still not in the CRA and are still in the building or in development. So standards are technical specification defining the requirements of the text. The specification are generally voluntary, but they have the advantage that uh, to give an organization the presumption of conformity. All right, so I can voluntarily uh, uh, adopt a standard uh, for my product, my open source product, for instance. Um, and then this will allow me to have the presumption of conformity for all my products, thanks to following the, the steps of the standards. If we talk about processes, for instance. Uh, they're developed by the industry. In our case, they could also uh, uh, be developed uh, by the open source community, but within a European standardization organization. The reason I'm underlining this is because it's really important to understand that the Open Regulatory Compliance Working Group within Eclipse is not here to define standards, but it's here to define technical specification that can then be submitted to ESOs, European standardization organizations, that can then transform that with the members of an ESO, like Sensenelec, like Etsy, um, uh, be transformed into a, a standard. And they follow uh, certain principles, consensus, openness, transparency, and obviously non-discrimination, which uh, are very close to the, 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 the principles that we know in the open source uh, community, but that we also follow in the open regulatory compliance working group. Now, the third element is the guidance and other type of documents. So if you remember in the CRA, normally we should have guidances concerning elements concerning the, uh, the, the open source uh, community and the open source aspects of the Cyber Resilience Act, for instance, the scope. So now we should be clear on what's the structure of an EU legislation. You would have the body of the text, you'd have the recitals helping you to understand, but then you also have a, a bunch of other documents, implementing act, delegated act, standards, guidance, and other documents. Now, if we look more on the open source side of the CRA, right? So if I take everything that I've learned through uh, the last 10, 15 minutes, and I try to apply this to first the CRA, second, the open source of related requirements that are present in the CRA. What do I understand? What do I read? And how do I efficiently read and understand the text? Again, same thing than before, we have our text on the left and we're trying to understand where should we look uh, in the CRA for an easy compliance. Here we'd have the recitals, we'd have the articles, and then we'd have the annexes. And then after that, I'd come back to the, the three other documents. If I'm a manufacturer, right, I look at the CRA and what I read directly is that all articles applicable to manufacturers of closed source software, they also apply to open source products of an organization that makes the open source product available on the market and supplied in the course of a commercial activity. So Closed source software, open source software, it doesn't really matter as long as it's available on the market and supplied in the course of a commercial activity. Here again, um, this presentation is not for me to give uh, legal advice or legal interpretation of the text. We'd have other presentation for this, but I think it's important to understand this so that we understand what articles are actually applicable to the manufacturers, right? So here I'm an open source manufacturer. Definition 
obligation of manufacturers, reporting obligation of manufacturers, voluntary reporting that manufacturers can do, all of the above and others are applicable to open source product and open source organization in the sense that they made the product available uh, on the market and supplied in the course of a commercial activity. Um, here, the example that I generally use when I discuss about this uh, within the, the Eclipse Foundation, again, it's not me giving a legal advice, it's it's my interpretation of the text, and that's that's what I, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining within my organization, uh, the Eclipse Foundation, is a single vendor open source uh, project is subjected to the same obligation that a closed source product. Same for a company that develop an open source product, it will be subjected to the same open source, it will be subject to the same uh, requirements, same obligation that if it was closed source software. Um, it's, it's really important that we underline this so that we understand what will be the challenges for manufacturers when complying with the CRA. Here, the recitals 15 to 18, they will give you more context of what is a commercial activity. So if I am an organization uh, or if I am the person in charge of compliance, this will give me more context to understand, for instance, what is commercial activity, which is not an easy concept, um, as, as many have, have underlined and, and we've discussed in the past already. And then again, same thing to the annexes applied to the articles, all the relevant annexes applicable to closed source also apply to my open source project and to my organization as long as it's made available on the market and supplied in the course of a commercial activity. Now, if we talk about stewards, that is very different because stewards have their own definition. They're defined uh, differently uh, than manufacturers in the text, right? They have the definition in Article 3, Paragraph 14. They have their own article that is defining their obligation. So if I am working for an open source steward, I know where to look at. Article 24 will give me uh, the obligation I should follow. Uh, there are also elements, uh, uh, for example, articles concerning presumption of conformity, articles concerning guidance and attestation that are useful to stewards as much as they're useful to manufacturers. And I will come back to this in, in, in a little time. And then uh, here again, article 15 to 19, they give me more context, helping me to understand the scope of my obligation and the scope of the text itself. Um, uh, you will notice that there is a one uh, recital that is different between the manufacturer and the stewards because recital 19 specifically focus on what is a manufacturer, what's the role of a manufacturer. Uh, for example, I know that there are many questions concerning, uh, you know, whether or not an, an open source steward has to be a non-for-profit, all these elements. Normally, recital 19, 19 sorry, should give you context and, and the reasoning and clarification uh, concerning these questions. So. Here, I was discussing articles, recitals, and annexes that are relevant to the manufacturers and the stewards, and therefore the open source community as a whole. Now, if I look at the Implementing Act and the Delegated Act, you, if you remember um, something like five to 10 minutes ago, I was saying how Implementing Act and Delegated Act are relevant for the open source community um, uh, concerning the CRA. So let's see what are the implementing acts and where can I find all these implementing acts in the text, right? So the implementing act already, the first one that you can find in Article 7 is here and will be here in order to specify the technical description of the categories of important products, for example, products with digital elements, obviously. Um, this, if you remember, and if you're part of the Open Source Regulatory Compliance Working Group, you would have seen that Toby has already started to sort of animate uh, discussions within our open source regulatory compliance working group so that uh, we can contribute to uh, this drafting of the implementing act. Sorry. So um, here we're really talking about the te technical description of, of um, the categories of important product. And if you remember the way I've defined uh, implementing act here it's really so that we have a harmonious uh, sort of implementation of the text and we all completely understand technically speaking what products are we talking about when we talk about important products because important products have their own sort of um, uh, requirements um, and it's interesting also to see concerning implementing act that um, the Commission may also adopt implementing acts, taking into account European or, in, or international standards and best practices. 
to specify the format and elements of an SBOM, for instance. Here we're talking about Article 13, Paragraph 24. So you see, it's not a small element for the open source community. Yeah? And then finally, you would find uh, uh, implementing act that would be here in order to uh, specify uh, the format and procedures concerning voluntary uh, reporting. Um, now, if we talk about standards um, and the implement, implementing act that could be connected to standards, um, it is possible um, that uh, the Commission could adopt implementing act that are here to establish common specification covering technical requirements um, to provide means to comply with the essential requirements. What does it mean uh, concretely? It means that if um, the institutions are not satisfied by the way the standards were made or the result of the standards made by the ESOs, for example, Simpson Elect, Etsy, those that I mentioned before, it is possible for the Commission to adopt an implementing act or several implementing acts that will define um, a common specification that will also allow presumption of conformity the same way that standards would allow presumption of conformity. So here, these are what I believe the implementing act that we should, as a community, keep an eye on so that we really uh, follow the way the, the CRA will be implemented and we really have an overview of the legal requirements that are on our organizations. Now, concerning the Delegated Act, again, um, it's not a small element for the open source community. I would even say it's, I would say it's a pretty much a core element uh, for us. If we really want to improve uh, the security of our supply chain and comply with the CRA, but also sort of grow as, an org, as, as a community in terms of, of, of cybersecurity practices, it's concerning what it's called the um, uh, voluntary security attestation programs. So these attestation programs in the text are here to facilitate the due diligence obligation, right? So if I am a manufacturer, for instance, um, and I have an obligation to uh, do due diligence, and I will give you uh, some more information about what is the obligation on due diligence uh, for manufacturers. Um, but it's not easy, right, uh, to have this due diligence. I still have to assess every single component that I have in my supply chain. This is a lot of struggle. Um, and then the, the CRA, therefore, thought of something like this, an attestation program that anyone can uh, apply for, an open source component, say, component A that is under the stewardship of stewards uh, B. Uh, a company, C in that case, can apply for uh, an attestation concerning that component A under the stewardship of uh, stewards B, so that it would be smoother and easier for that organization, that company, that has to uh, uh, apply due diligence on its supply chain to easily comply with this due diligence uh, obligation. Here again, a core element of the CRA is delegated act because it would really make life easier for both the stewards and the, the manufacturer if the attestations programs are widely adopted uh, across the supply chain. So here, again, delegated act, although it's not part of the body of the text itself, represents a massive element uh, for the open source community to, uh, to, to comply with the CRA. Now, entering into um, uh, the standards, um, as I've mentioned before, um, the, the standards will allow for uh, the presumption of conformity. Uh, what's interesting to see concerning the CRA, and it's really important to, for us as a community to understand this and to understand the role that an open source regulatory and compliance working group is playing, is that this draft standardization request includes an element that clearly says that the, that the open source community needs to be consulted by the ESOs, the, um, so uh, SEN, Senelec, and Etsy. Uh, the draft standardization request is listing 44 standards. It's available online. You can have access to it, and there will be a link uh, under this slide um, about, about this draft standardization request that you can read. Uh, we, it's also important to notice that on specific standards, if you have questions about what standards mean what and when will it be developed, what will be the timeline, all these elements that are very important to sort of comply with the CRA and navigate the CRA as an organization, um, so we will have a topic, uh, we'll have a, a dedicated meeting on this topic on July 29, 2024. So if you have questions on this, uh, please join this call. I think it will be one of the core elements uh, in order to understand what will be the work of the Open Regulatory Compliance uh, Working Group in the near future.
Finally, uh, guidance and, and others. Um, here, uh, the scope and nature of, of the guidances um, are defined in Article uh, 26 uh, of the text together with relevant recitals. And here you will see that there is a clear reference to open source software in this article, but also an obligation to consult the relevant stakeholders when building uh, those guidances, right? So if you look the four types of guidances that are relevant to the open source community, uh, there is one that clearly say, uh, uh, that it will uh, give guidance on the scope of this regulation, right? So am I in the scope? Am I not in the scope? Am I a steward? Am I not a steward? Is my product uh, uh, supplied in the course of a commercial activity or not? This will be part of this guidance, for instance, or at least that's the way I understand it. And uh, there is a clear obligation of the institution to consult the relevant stakeholders here, it would be very strange uh, to consider the free and open source community is not a relevant stakeholders in order to create the guidance on free and open source software. So it would be a key element for the open regulatory compliance working group to sort of uh, uh, be involved in this in these elements. And, and we surely and totally will confirm that, I suppose, in, in, in right after I finish my presentation, that we will contribute to such guidances. After that, the application of support periods. Uh, there are uh, guidance targeted at manufacturers um, uh, specifically uh, when it comes to complying with this regulation together with other regulation. Um, you know, uh, the EU over the last five, 10 years has adopted a lot of uh, cybersecurity related legislation. So it's really important also to understand as a manufacturer, how do I navigate between the different legislations? For example, if I comply to legislation A, do I also comply with the CRA at the same time? This uh, will be explained um, uh, in a guidance. Well, at least that's my interpretation of the text. And then there will be also uh, uh, a guidance on the concept of substantial modification. The reason why it matters for the open source community is to understand when my open source project is modified, do I need to apply again, for example, for attestation program uh, if I am a steward, or uh, do I need to apply for CE marking again and comply another time uh, with the legislation because I have modified the software? What is substantial? What is not substantial? Um, enough so that I have to redo the whole work again. Um, here again, guidance is key element in order to understand the, and read the CRA. However, uh, it's not exactly uh, completely developed yet, same way that implementing act and delegated act are yet to be developed. So now that we have an understanding of the structure of an annual legislation so that we can read it easily, and then we also have an understanding of what are the open source related elements in the CRA, including elements that are already in the text, elements that will be developed in the near future, such as implementing act guidances, et cetera. We thought that it would be a very interesting um, part of the conversation today to also add use cases. And, and so the first use case that we wanted to use is a use case that we use a lot within the open source, uh, within the Eclipse Foundation, is the case of an open source foundation releasing open source projects deployed by members and individual contributors, right? So if you're an open source foundation, you have different members potentially that all together develop open source software under your stewardship, under your governance, and you also have individual contributors contributing to the open source software. Uh, you have commuters, maintainers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what are the relevant articles to you, and what are the challenges that you will have, and and how can you quickly assess the situation for, for your foundation, right? So the relevant article here would be Article 3 and Article 24. Article 3 would give you a definition, what is software, what is open source stewards, and Article 24 will give you your obligation, right? So it will be my obligation as a steward to follow. Um, if we quickly read uh, the obligations here uh, today, it's to put in place and document uh, in a verifiable matter, uh, cybersecurity policy, similar for an effective handling of vulnerabilities by the developers of that product, right? So I am a foundation, I have to put in place those two or three things, uh, we could say, uh, in a verifiable manner um, for my developers, for example. Uh, there are also obligations on notification of exploitable vulnerabilities that specifically apply to you, although they're normally designed for a manufacturer, if uh, as a foundation, you are also involved in the software development of, of your product. So normally it's not applicable to you, but it was considered by the institution that if your foundation or if you steward in that case, 
is involved within the development of the software, then it should also apply, it should also uh, abide by the obligations on notification of exploitable vulnerabilities. In certain cases, you would also have ob other obligations of manufacturers that also apply to you. Um, you'd have obligation on communication of exploitable vulnerabilities um, to users that apply to you, notification of severe incidents to authorities, and, and elements as such um, that will uh, define uh, your, your obligation that sort of fall outside of what traditionally should be the obligation of a steward. So it's sort of an exception in that, in that case. Um, you would also have Article 25, uh, sorry for the typo on the slide, that will define the scope and the procedure of the attestation uh, program that I mentioned before that I, as a foundation, can apply for if I want my projects to be uh, um, to be sort of testified under these attestation programs. And then you'd have the relevant recitals that I mentioned before, so I don't think it is for us to sort of go through the recitals again. Now, the standards here, and it's really important that we understand this, there's no reference uh, to standards directly applicable to stewards in the text, which makes sense because the stewards have a lighter regime. But there are other guidance, uh, other documents that, such as guidance that could, in theory, refer to existing standards and specification to facilitate the compliance of stewards, right? So a guidance will tell you this and that, or the attestation program will tell you that you have to follow this and that, and it's possible. Uh, for these attestation programs to refer to existing documents such as standards or technical specification. For example, a technical specification that the open source regulatory compliance would be developing. It's not ensured, it's not sure, but it's a possibility. Um, it's also important to understand that although stewards originally might not be subjected to manufacturer's obligation, therefore they might not need a uh, presumption of conformity as defined within the text, it's also, if you remember well, the fact that stewards could be exceptionally subjected to obligation of manufacturers, and therefore the standards that will be developed um, by the ISOs would also be relevant for um, the foundations. Again, here we're talking, for example, if the foundation is involved within the development process of the open source project. And after standards, the same way that we've mentioned before, we have implementing act and delegated act. And here, uh, define technically the products that are released under the scope of the CRA, very relevant for a foundation. The foundation should be involved into uh, the, the development of such technical definition. It's really key for a foundation to do that. Same that uh, if an implementing act is defining the format and procedures of an SBOM that as a foundation I could potentially reuse, it's very important for a foundation to understand that this will impact um, it's its work because such uh, SBOM will then have to be used by, by a foundation, for instance, in certain situations. And then, obviously, the Delegated Act um, uh, concerning the attestation program is very relevant for my foundation because I can apply for such attestation and that will facilitate the use of my software by the manufacturers of product, right? So if my challenge as a foundation is to be sure that as many companies or all my corporate members can use easily my open source software in their supply chain and it doesn't create struggles for companies and my members to use this in their supply chain, then the attestation program will be a key element for me because it's only after I've had the attestation that my members that are, for example, potentially manufacturers of, open, of products with digital elements leveraging open source components that I provide um, or that are under my stewardship, I should say, that um, it would facilitate the work. Otherwise, it would create a lot of instability. It's not easy for manufacturers. Manufacturers therefore lose a sort of competitive advantage of open source software. So it is key, obviously, for any foundation to uh, have a lot of attestation for all the open source projects. Again, helping manufacturers, helping individuals, helping the community as a whole to sort of rely on, on this open source component that my open source project as a foundation represents. Finally, so this was the last slide concerning the use case of open source foundation. We thought it would also be interesting to give a very short use case of um, a manufacturer. Here, the situation is slightly different. That's why I mentioned sort of a short use case uh, for a manufacturer, but the challenge is not smaller. So the use case would be, I am a company releasing open source products that constitute part of my commercial activities. 
here the relevant articles, the relevant uh, recitals, all the articles applicable to manufacturers of closed source software also apply to me and my product as an organization. It is again very important to understand something uh, underlined just before, which is the fact that my organization, say I work for company A, is subjected to a due diligence obligation for open source components that are present in my product in my supply chain, right? So I cannot, this obligation says I cannot uh, rely products on the market um, if I didn't do the right due diligence on the open source components that I have in my product in my supply chain. That's why the whole attestation program that I've mentioned before is so important, right? The relevant recitals I've mentioned them before, 15 to 18. The standards here, very similar to uh, the relevant article. All the standards uh, or articles related to standards are applicable to uh, my open source product and my organization as well. Here, uh, the Delegated Act again um, will uh, define the attestation uh, program. But the reason why I put this again on this slide, it's because my organization can also apply for such attestation for any open source component, right? Say the example I've mentioned before, if I was a foundation, it was useful for me to apply to um, 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 an attestation because then all my members and all the companies that rely on my uh, or support me can then easily rely on my components, right? So it's a logical step for me as a foundation to help. But what's interesting here is to say that any organization, again, taking company A as an example, as a company A, I can apply for the attestation of an open source component that is under the stewardship of a foundation that I've never been in contact with, but is still present in my supply chain. It's the same if uh, there is an open source component that was not uh, um, put on the market in, in the, and supplied in the course of a commercial activity by another manufacturer. And therefore, this manufacturer never thought of putting this open source, um, uh, sorry, this C marking on, on, on the product. Then I can still say, OK, I need uh, stability in my supply chain. I can apply as company A. Uh, for the attestation of this open source component that is developed by company B that is not using it in, its, in the course of a commercial activity. So what's interesting with this use case is all the challenges that articles and recitals and standards are creating, right? Some elements concerning the scope, uh, for example, commercial activities will be defining guidance after consultation of experts. So it's very important for me as an organization to be able to take part of this discussion and this consultation of experts of the open source community. Same for the standards. Um, as a manufacturer, I said before, um, the obligation of manufacturers of closed source products are exactly the same that for open source products, right? And I can use standards for presumption of conformity. The problem is maybe the standards that will be defined for closed source software might not be suitable for open source software that are developed, right? There are obligations concerning updates. There are obligations concerning communication with users. There are obligations concerning the development process and different steps that I should follow in my development process. There is nothing uh, that uh, says in the text that Something that is easily applicable to closed source software would be easily applicable to open source software. So therefore, the challenge will be for open source companies and the open source community that is developing commercial activity on top of this, that the standards that are defined for presumption of conformity are also a right fit for the open source community and for open source product. Because the CRA does not really you know, create an exception for you there. You have to really find the right uh, standards for you to be able to comply. Otherwise, you lose the ability to get presumption of conformity. And if you lose the ability to have presumption of conformity, it's an enormous disadvantage as opposed to closed source software, but that's also a lot of hurdles for your compliance, your legal department and security departments. Finally, the last challenge for um, and this, this company A, uh, this manufacturer that, that we've mentioned here is that my organization, as company A depends heavily on manufacturers of other open source components and also open source stewards to comply with the due diligence obligation. What does it mean? It means that it would be very hard for me to comply with my due diligence uh, obligation under, C under the CRA, the one that I've mentioned in, in the previous slides, if I don't collaborate easily with all manufacturers of open source components and all stewards uh, that are providing or stewarding open source components. Because if they don't apply, for example, attestation programs to their products, then I would have to check everything. And this will, again, delay 
for example, uh, access to market or a speed of, of putting a product on the market, which obviously in, in a competitive market like the digital sector is a key element. So this was for the two use cases and I, I hope they have been useful. Um, we plan to have uh, 15 minutes um, for questions and then 30 minutes of presentation. I think I did 35 minutes. So therefore, I'm just, I just want to quickly conclude before I take all the questions you might have. And there are six points that I, I, I want to, to conclude on this presentation on you know, how to read the open source, uh, how to read the CRA from an open source angle. The first thing is that the articles define the scope, the requirements, but not all of the articles are applicable to more organizations. So if I am in part of the open source community and I have a lot of stuff to do, I'm developing software, my job is not to handle compliance, et cetera, et cetera, as we know that it could be the struggle in the open source community, then we have to understand one thing, I don't have to read everything. I can also just focus specifically on the articles that apply to my organization. The recitals is a similar situation. The recitals, they're giving me a missing context and additional information in case something is not clear. I don't have to read the entire CRA and the entire recitals if it's not needed. I can focus on the recitals that actually help me understanding the text. Thirdly, the annex will include the technical elements. So if I'm missing technical context as part of the, of, of the text, I can go in the annex. For example, if I'm not sure about what's the meaning of that essential requirement, then I can go in the annex and the annex will give me more information about what it means. The fourth element, and it's not the fourth element, and it's not the smallest one, and I believe it's the biggest one, and the reason why uh, this open source regulatory compliance is so relevant and so needed by the open source community is that Elements such as standards, implementing act, guidance, delegated act, attestation, they're still missing. They're not there. They, they're not part of the text yet. They're being developed at the moment. So if we don't, as a community, start acting on this, then they will be developed without us. And that was what we have in the past uh, complained so much about that when the drafting of the CRA was there, we were involved so much. So it's really important for us to understand that it's a key opportunity for us to really take ownership and leadership and be empowered by, by this drafting situation and the opportunity that the Open Regulatory Compliance Working Group give us as a community. Finally, as a manufacturer, my organization depends a lot on open source implementation, even if I don't identify as an organization that rely a lot on open source component, blah, blah, it's needed. You won't be able to without the open source community. And finally, the open source regulatory compliance will provide a space uh, uh, for the open source community to do the work on technical contents and all the elements that I've mentioned before. And Toby here in, in this call will be uh, leading all of this work uh, here um, greatly, I am sure, and I've seen it. So thank you very much for your time. And Toby, I'll let you handle the questions and I'll try to answer as much as I can today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Enzo. So I had learned a ton just like going through the slides and I learned like 10 times more just like listening to you right now. Uh, so thank you very much for this. Um, so we have a few questions, and I think one is going to tie well with the conclusions that you were just asking, uh, that you were just going over right now. Um, and this comes from Tobias uh, of Freck. Um, who and when will the guidance be published? Uh, who will write? Or who will write them? I think that's a that's a good question to have an answer to. You're on mute, uh, Enzo. Yeah, no, sorry. I was saying it's a, it's a good question. I think I can share my screen again because some of the answers will probably be on the screen uh, in some of the slides that I put. So I share my screen again here. Um, I don't want to go through all the slides, et cetera, but I think what's important here is to really understand that some of the guidances will be developed by the commission. They have an obligation to consult the relevant stakeholders but it will be developed by the commission. So the idea is that the commission uh, will uh, consult the relevant stakeholders and then maybe before or during the drafting of the, the guidance. Maybe a draft uh, guidance will be published. It's also possible. It's, it's all in the end of the, of the services of the European Commission to develop such guidances. But having an obligation to consult the relevant stakeholders in that case, open source software, the open source community, that's a big thing. It means that we will have a say in there. Uh, concerning the timeline, I really invite you, I don't have the timeline available simply because of two reasons. First, the CRA text still needs to be voted. There shouldn't be any problem with this and I don't see any problem coming in uh, concerning the final vote of the text. Uh, 
but only after the text has been voted, it's easy to have uh, deadlines uh, for the text itself. And finally, if I remember well the text um, of the CRA, I don't remember seeing any uh, guidelines specific, but I would really, uh, if you have a question about this, look at Article 26 of the CRA. You can just control um, uh, search uh, on the CRA uh, Article 26 and you will find all the information. I suppose, to answer fully the question, that after the standards have been made, it would give more time to develop the guidances. I hope it helps. Yeah, thank you very much for this. This is very helpful. Uh, one of the things that we're planning to do is to uh, have a timeline of all of those different um, uh, a key sort of like uh, um, points, milestones, uh, in a way that's really easily findable by the community on our uh, hub, the hub that we're yeah. working on um, right now um, in an open in an open fashion. Um, I think maybe, uh, I don't oh, know if I said it before, oh, sorry. but I think there is also a call that would be specifically focusing on guidances in August. Um, we haven't said it before, but the idea of those calls is that we'll also have the contribution of the European institution building those calls. And as I said, the fourth one is specifically on guidances, and I'm pretty sure questions concerning deadlines and timelines would be in that presentation. Wonderful. Okay, so thank you for those precisions. Um, uh, another follow-up question, um, which uh, still by Tobias, can you please give a concrete example of an implementing act from another area than the CRA? Uh, so, or or rather said, uh, what exactly is going to be in the in the CRA? Uh, in the implementing act um, that, um, uh, you know, to, to make it concrete, like what are we expecting to see there? So um, I tried to, to explain it before, but really an implementing act. So I'm trying to find a perfect example of what will be an implementing act under the CRA, right? So, right, so implementing. So there'll be several implementing acts. So I can't really tell you which implementing act is gonna have what, in the sense that I can't give you a one, sentence answer saying an implementing act has this because all implementing acts will have different elements within it, right, within them. Um, so if I take the implementing act that are listed here that I saw are, were relevant to the open source community and the one that you're working on, Toby, at the moment um, is on the technical description of categories of important product. So you can hear, you can really expect that the implementing act will take uh, the, the annex uh, that is defining uh, uh, important products and the text that is defining important products and really add technical description of what is this product, what is product A, what is product B, what is, I think there is uh, one call uh, that organized by the commission on these categories that is about operating system, for instance, you can really expect an actual technical description of what is an operating system doing, how is it doing it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what you can expect in such an implementing act. After that, as I said before, you'd have implementing acts concerning uh, common specifications, for instance. This would look more like a standard, I suppose, um, um, because they, they are to be adopted if the standards uh, process is failed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So all implementing acts will look different based on the reason why they exist. Wonderful, thank you. Um, a follow-up question from Yana Vesterkamp. Um, Yana asks, so for use, including commercial one of a component, including an open source one, attestation is required. Uh, so this is enforcing attestation on open source components for supporting their use, even in commercial use case. And commercial attestations can be done to cover missing attestation of an open source component. Um, so if, uh, what I'm hearing asked here is, um, essentially, will attestations be necessary even for commercial use, right? I think that's the first part of the, of the question. Um, uh, and, uh, and can, um, um, can essentially, can you, can a, a commercial actor um, uh, do, do a, um, an attestation themselves when one's missing from an open source component? complicated question. I try to give an easy answer. Um, and if someone, if the person that wrote the question can step in and also explain a bit more the question, I'm also happy to to get this because uh, uh, it was very difficult. We only have uh, a few uh, minutes left. Yeah, don't worry. I was just reading the question as well and I was I was struggling to understand. So uh, 
attestation, anyone can apply for an attestation, right? So uh, it's not that the attestation is necessary for the due diligence obligation, as in, if I am a manufacturer and I want to comply with the CRA, I don't specifically need attestation in order to comply with the CRA. I can completely put a product on the market without having my all my open source components, um, all the open source components of my product having attestations. It is possible, there is no obligation. That's why they call voluntary uh, security attestation program, it's voluntary. Um, however, if I don't have an attestation program, my company has to check the requirements of every single component, open source component that I have integrated, right? So if it's an open source component under the leadership of the stewardship of a foundation, I have to check that the foundation and the open source component comply with all the obligation of a steward. If I'm taking my uh, open source component from an other organization, I have to make sure that the other organization is complying with all the elements uh, of the CRA. Basically, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hours and weeks and months of, of, of due diligence uh, of this of this supply chain. In that case, the attestation program is voluntary, but it's going to make any company and our market as a whole, the European market, 100 times faster when it comes to putting markets on the product if, if you apply to. And finally, the third part of the question is, again, anyone can apply. So if I am company A and I'm leveraging the components of company B, I can completely, as company A, apply for the attestation of the open source component of company B. It's possible. And then the attestation will be out there. And that's the whole beauty of the attestation program. It's sort of reusing the principle of the open source community to apply it to the CRA. All right. Thank you very much, Enzo. Um, I think we're running out of time right now. We're going to make a note of the questions that are left here um, and figure out a way to either answer them directly on the mailing list um, or or maybe um, bring them up like in, in a, in a, in a follow-up uh, call or figure something out. Uh, I'd like to wrap this up uh, really quickly um, uh, to make sure that we end on time. I think we had a few slides left. Um, here we go. Right. So this was the first webinar of a series. We're going to uh, have three more. Um, um, one next week on the obligations of the CRA, uh, which will be really focused on the obligations for the open source community. So I, I imagine digging deeper uh, and, and sort of uh, um, more horizontally into the use cases um, that Enzo um, brought up today. Um, then we're going to have a, a third webinar specifically on the standards um, process to really understand the timeline there, understand like where exactly the um, working group can impact those standards. Um, and then lastly, we'll have a call on the implementation guidelines um, that we talked quite a bit today. Um, um, and I uh, will... Um, uh, I will answer questions around the, there were questions around the mailing list and how to subscribe to the mailing list uh, in the last uh, in the last slide. And so if you can um, um, point me to the last slide. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. So um, um, next webinar, it's uh, next week. Um, uh, and uh, uh, well, do, do you mind putting the slide up, uh, Enzo? It's gone. The slide is gone. Okay, so we will be sharing with everyone that um, uh, subscribed to this webinar, the slides and the recording. In the slides, you have all of the links to uh, the working group mailing list, our matrix server, the different GitLab repositories that we use to run the work. Um, and uh, we will also, on the mailing list, send a registration link for the next webinar, which I think is next week. Um, so again, thank you very much for showing up today. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you very much, Enzo, for enlightening us and uh, overall the broad open source community on um, all of those the details of the European legislation. Thank you very much, everyone. And bye for now.